Thank you for being here, Ian. All right, thanks, Tony. Um, all right, I'll switch over to uh, share my screen now. And all right, so um, I'm sure people will have questions. I'll try to take a couple breaks, try to aim for three breaks here to answer some questions. Um, and I think uh, I don't have a ton of experience with Zoom presentations. I've done a few, but if anything comes up, um, let us know. Julie, Julia or Tony will jump in and help me out. All right, so confusing fall warblers. Um, yeah, it's only July. Um, August is tomorrow, but this is the perfect time to get out there and start looking for these fall warblers. And honestly, this was um, one of the most exciting aspects of birding when I was starting out. You know, in the spring, you get to know some of the warblers, you get to learn their songs, you see them in their bright plumage, but then the real challenge came in fall where you get to see them in a completely different setting. They look different, they sound different, they behave a little different. And uh, that was the really fun challenge. Any day that you go out, there's something new that you could find or, or experience. Um, and so that's why I really kind of fell in love with this time of year and looking at these birds. So I hope I can share some of the insights that I've learned over the years with you guys today. All right, so this is an overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, taxonomy, what are the wood warblers, the eastern wood warblers we're, we're discussing, uh, the season, habitat, behavior, plumage, migration routes, uh, and then the, the bulk of this will be like species accounts going over the difference between some of these confusing groups. And then I'm going to mix in some quizzes, so we'll have some fun here, and, and that's when uh, we can have some people chime in. It'll start out easy, and it'll get a little harder as we go, so it should be pretty fun. All right, so these are... Um, our eastern fall migrant wood warblers. These are the ones that you can run into pretty much um, any fall. You'll get most of them. There's always a couple. I mean, you can see right here, Connecticut warbler is usually the holy grail bird um, that you always look to hope to find every fall. Um, and some of them pass by before we really notice uh, yellow-throated, cerulean, Kentucky warblers are all really early migrants, and I'll get into that a little bit too. But this is what we'll be talking about. I'll show some pictures of all of these, and then I'll get into uh, some more details. So we're talking about Perulidae. That's the, that's the main family. And I'm just going to go through each uh, genera here. So Sayuris, this is oven bird. Um, I'm not going to go into details about these single genus groups uh, or single species genus genera. Uh, oven birds on their own. They look like mini wood thrushes. Pretty distinctive. Um, we've got worm-eating warbler. Uh, these are the water thrushes, Parkesius. You got northern water thrush on the left, uh, Louisiana water thrush on the right. Protonotaria, it's in the name, Protonotary warbler, the golden swamp warbler. Miniotilta, this is black and white warbler. Vermivora, uh, blue winged and golden winged warblers, plus you've got the hybrids in between, so uh, Lawrence's and Brewster's warblers. Uh, Leothlipus, which used to be Oreothlipus, and I'll refer to them as Oreothlipus probably. That's how I knew them, and I always liked calling them Oreos because they look, they have a lot of similar traits. Uh, Geothlipus, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Leothlipus, this is uh, Tennessee Warbler, Nashville Warbler, and Orange Crown. Um, Geothlipus is Common Yellowthroat, Kentucky Warbler, and Morning Warbler. And Operornis, um, which is now solely, unless things have changed and I haven't caught up, is solely Connecticut Warbler. And here's a really nice fall image of one. Um, and then this is the bulk of them, Cetophaga. So this is uh, red starts, um, perulas, yellow, Cape May, black-throated blue and green, um, pine warblers, yellow rumps, um, chestnut-sided, prairie, cerulean, yellow-throated, uh, palm, bay-breasted, black hole, blackburnian, magnolia. <laughs> uh, let's see what else do we have in there, and hooded. So there's 18 of them in there. Um, and then, Here's the last group. So this is um, this is Canada Warbler and Wilson's Warbler. And, and this is where you can really see those similarities. You see how chubby they are. They're just kind of these pudgy birds. They have a like a round face to them. They're really, really distinct once you see them next to each other and you know they're related. And that really helps a lot with identifying birds. It's not always the plumage that you're looking for. It's, it's a lot of the little details. I was talking to Julia earlier about the chip notes are just like different things that you can't quite place why you know it is what it is. And some of those things are like, well, look at the round shape of the head, um, you know, longer tail, um, something about its behavior. 
those little things that are really helpful. <clears throat> All right, so going through the season for fall migration. So Tony said we're in July, we, you know, we're, we're thinking about fall migration, but the reality is it's already happened. Um, <clears throat> so migration really starts mid-July and it goes through even November in some cases, uh, depending when birds are really moving. Um, it is defined by the completion of their pre-basic molt. So once they get into winter plumage, which they, they molt into on their breeding grounds, then they can make that journey. They're ready, their, their wings are ready, their, their new feathers are ready to go. And each species has its own uh, migration phenology. So it has different start and end dates, uh, peak migrations. Here's a really great image from uh, the Audubon magazine that just came out this year. Uh, it, this shows spring migration, but you can almost flip it and you can you know, reverse those uh, trends there and you can see fall migration happening. So you, you kind of work your way from <clears throat> different flycatchers. Here's like um, Red Start, Swainton's so thrush, Magnolia warbler. These are like the bulk of, of that like September migration. And you move on down through to like yellow rumps. Um, white-throated sparrows are always a signal of like, all right, fall's definitely here. The, the white-throated sparrows are here and down to hermit thrushes and ruby crown kinglets. So <clears throat> first step in trying to see fall warblers, you have to be in the right place. So you're in the right time, you're in the fall. Where do you go to find these birds? So <clears throat> a lot of times the preferences that these birds um, have for habitat is very similar to what their breeding grounds are like. There's a couple exceptions to that, but if they're birds that are attracted to water, like the water thrushes, they'll be near bodies of water. So northern water thrush usually near still water, Louisiana water thrush um, near moving water. Um, shrubs and goldenrod fields are great habitat for finding different things They like to bounce around. Um, orange crown warblers usually love goldenrod fields. Um, shrub thickets are great for, for multiple reasons, great line of sight. That's the big thing to target is you have to be able to see. So you don't wanna go into a, a you know, thick mature forest with trees that are going 100 feet above your head, you're gonna get warbler neck. So you wanna make sure that you, you're looking at areas like you can see in this field here. If you're on the edge, you have a really great look. Um, I also like to target, I like to go out in the morning as, as early as I can, usually before first light. Um, here's some of the, the flight calls as things are kind of settling in for the day. And then I look for those areas where the sun is just starting to hit. So where the sun is starting to warm up those leaves, starting to warm up the caterpillars and the birds. And so everything's happening. That's where the action usually starts. And then it extends out from there as the temperature warms up in the day. Uh, but finding those areas where you have good line of sight, you're not arching your neck way up. Um, you got some sunlight, so you're able to see easier. Um, and then look for migration corridors. Ridge tops are fantastic. Um, other areas where it kind of funnels birds in to one, to one area, they're really, really helpful. It kind of gives that fallout a possibility. The other big thing, you have to look for native plants. So I might be a little biased here, but native plants are really essential for uh, fall foraging with these birds. Um, they're the ones that are supporting the insects and uh, therefore supporting the birds. So when these birds are coming through, they're really looking to um, build fat fast. They're just constantly just burning calories on this migration and they need to keep filling themselves up any chance they get anytime they're not flying. So they're looking for caterpillars primarily, and then some of them are also looking for fruits. You can see um, yellow rumped warblers are, I see them a lot eating poison ivy berries in the fall. Nice high fat fruit, um, they go to a lot. Uh, but for the most part, they're looking for uh, native plants that have soft bodied insects or caterpillars on them. Uh, so the most productive trees that I see are oaks, uh, cherries, willows, birches, poplars, the list here. Um, one that doesn't have a, a ton of diversity of insects that feed on it, but I find to be very useful is are the walnuts and hickories, particularly walnuts. I, I find a lot of birds that are drawn into walnuts and they're easier to see then because the foliage is a lot looser. It's a lot easier to see into there. Um, it's very difficult when you're looking into an oak tree sometimes and you're like, all right, there's a bird behind that. Nope, it's over on, it's behind that branch crawling on there. Um, it can be really difficult to see. And some of those more open trees are a lot easier. Uh, trees that have fruit in the fall that birds are going to go after um, include black gum, uh, dogwoods, particularly flowering dogwood, um, and different viburnums. And a lot of times they've actually timed their fruit ripening to coincide with this migration in the fall. 
Um, so these birds are able to eat the fruit and then they get to drop the seeds in places that are advantageous for these uh, species of trees and shrubs. All right, now that you're in the right place, um, the thing that you wanna look for, different foraging habits. Um, litter turning, uh, you see this a lot with uh, hooded warblers, oven birds. Uh, you'll find them down on the ground. So you're looking for things that are going to be flipping up leaves just like uh, you know, toeies or different sparrows are doing. Um, skulking, this is where kind of the holy grail birds are going to be, the uh, uh, morning warbler or Connecticut warbler, the things that are really difficult to see and also not that common. They're going to be skulking down low in thick vegetation. Um, gleaning, this is what a lot of the birds are going to be doing. They're going to be moving through trees, picking off caterpillars and other insects from leaves. Hover gleaning, some of the species will actually kind of fly up and then glean off of different trees and, and fly back to their perch. Um, that's yellow rump warblers are doing that a lot. You see Cape May is doing that. Um, creeping, primarily just with black and white warblers, they act like nut hatches, so they keep doing that in the fall as well. And then fly catching, I see that a lot with yellow rump warblers. Flying out, grabbing something out of midair, and then flying back to their perch. And so when you're looking for fall warblers, you also want to look for the other birds that are migrating or just hanging out in the area because they'll form these mixed species flocks. The warblers, the gnat catchers, vireos, fly catchers, chickadees, and titmice. Um, you can see them all working together and they're foraging in different places and you'll hear them as well. And I really hear the titmice and chickadees primarily, particularly the titmice. They're the most responsive as well. So if you're out and you're pishing, um, you're making different noises, try to attract them in, target the titmice. That's what I do a lot. I love to find out where the titmice are, call them in, pitch them in, get them a little annoyed, a little agitated. And then I don't pay attention to them as much. And I start to look at the other birds that are coming in around and checking out what's going on. And then I start to, to see different, different species in with them. And then eventually they, you know, I, I kind of got an idea of what's going on. They start to move on. I move on as well. It's really fun to watch that whole scene and play or scene play out. Um, other things to look for, tail bobbing and tail fanning. So tail bobbing is primarily with uh, Louisiana water thrush, palm warblers, you see them pumping their tails a lot um, or just kind of bobbing up and down. And then tail fanning, you see this a lot with red starts. They like to fan out their tail, show those orange um, sections of the sides of their tail. Um, I also see it sometimes with uh, hooded warblers. I'm trying to think of anything else that likes to tail fan. Those are the ones I see the most. All right, and just to, Going to go over plumage. I'm not going to go into detail about a lot of this. But the things that I'd like to point out here that are important uh, supercilium or superciliary line, really important when talking about these, these different birds, the eye line, of course. Um, then you go down, you have the, the nape and the mantle, um, breast, flanks, belly, of course, um, the vent, which is this area right behind the legs. And then the under and upper tail coverts, those are really important. Um, we're not going to go into too much of the wing um, uh, anatomy here. So here's a bunch of information about molting. Basic idea is birds need to replace their feathers periodically, usually twice throughout the year, certain feathers different times a year um, to maintain insulation and flight properties. But the one that we're really focused on for this talk is the pre-basic molt. So you have basic and alternate plumage. Alternate is the showy breeding plumage. Um, the basic plumage is the, uh, the winter, the non-breeding plumage. So we're focusing on what happens after that pre-basic molt. So this is when the birds are losing their, a lot of their showy colors. Some of them still keep them, but a lot of them do not. And they're shifting into this non-breeding plumage or winter plumage. Um, and this happens on their breeding ground before they start to fly south for the winter. And speaking of flying south, they don't always just fly south. They, they kind of vary a lot. Um, they're primarily nocturnal as well, but you can see these different routes that they're taking. Um, in the fall, the birds experience something that's been described as uh, Zugenru. And so this is this restlessness that they have. The birds are have this um, innate drive that they know it's that time of year that they need to start thinking about migration. So their, their body morphology changes, they end up, um, uh, Scott Widensall talked about this in his last book about how certain birds will actually um, shrink or expand certain organs in order to prepare for flight. So they are flying a lot and they're not focused on um, needing to have a lot of the other bodily activities working. So 
Um, the heart expands, different things like liver will shrink a bit. Um, the flight muscles expand, the leg muscles aren't working as much. And so the warblers do this to an extent. The main thing they do is they pack on a lot of fat. Um, they're eating a lot of a lot of food at this time and they're packing on that fuel ready to make this and sometimes uh, long flight with not a few stops on on the way. And now as opposed to the spring migration where the, a lot of the birds are kind of going straight up through the country, through the continent, from the tropics, the, the Central and South America areas where they're wintering, in the fall, they shift a little bit more eastward. This coincides with a lot of the weather patterns. They're looking for these storms that are coming in from the west and moving out through the east. And so birds, particularly like black pole warblers and Connecticut warblers, um, they will, they're from their breeding ground, sometimes all the way as far northwest as Alaska, will shift all the way across the continent to the east, shoot out into the Atlantic Ocean, and look for those trade winds that are heading down into the Caribbean. And so they'll catch a ride on those, on those winds and make it down to the Caribbean and then jump over the Antilles down to South America. Other birds will take a route down the East Coast, go down through the peninsula of Florida, jump off to Cuba and, and make it down either through the Antilles or over to the Yucatan. Others will jump right across the Gulf of Mexico and then um, others will decide to not bother with the water whatsoever and just stick with the land route and go through Mexico. Those are most of the routes that are happening, but a lot of them do like to shift more eastward in the fall, and they're usually following the central flyway more in the spring. So species that I notice that a lot with are orange crowned warblers. I, they definitely take a more central route in the spring, and they shift a little bit more eastern in the fall. And then Connecticut warblers are the other one that you really don't see them very much at all in the spring, in, especially in Pennsylvania, but in the fall, they definitely move through. They're difficult to find, but they're more common in the fall than in the spring. All right, so this is where I kind of want to get into talking about some different confusing groups. So this would be a good time if there's uh, questions that we have so far. I can answer some now. Please share your questions in the, the chat and we can, or uh, if you find the question and answer section. We can uh, make sure Ian can see those. I see Deborah Grimm mentioned hackberries. I, I'm not sure if the hackberries are, I guess they are probably ripening around that time. They're a little more sugar rich than fat rich, but they're also tasty for people too. They call them sugar berries for a reason. Um, any other questions anybody else has? Otherwise we'll just keep going. Valerie, can you type your question in the, the chat? I don't think I have a good way to I uh, give you permission to talk in this kind of webinar. Okay. All right, we'll keep moving on then. All right, uh, so these are the kind of the species accounts. I want to go through a little bit of phonology. Um, as I was showing earlier with that, the waves of migration, I tend to notice about three general waves. Um, there's a lot of nuance within each species and, and what's happening with weather and, uh, and even just population differences. If they have a boomier or a bustier in, um, on their breeding grounds, you can see different patterns happening each, you know, different years. But I tend to notice there's about three waves that are, that are noticeable. Um, if you wanna see some good accounts of how to how to really identify them well? Um, you got to look at the the undersides. Look at the warbler butts. That's a really great way to get to know these birds well, because a lot of times that's the best view you have of them. Uh, the warbler guide is a really fantastic guide for understanding that. Um, the other one I think that goes into some detail. This has been around for a while, but uh, the Peterson's Guide to Advanced Birding is wonderful. They go into some different uh, topics that I'm going to be bringing up today. Um, that's Ken Kaufman. Um, so yeah, we'll get into it. All right, so this first wave that I notice is uh, the southern breeders. So these are the birds that are breeding kind of south and just making it into Pennsylvania, sometimes just up to like the New York border. So prothonotary warbler, yellow-throated warbler, Kentucky, um, those are all breeding Pennsylvania or south primarily. Ceruleans make it a little farther north into, into um, New York. Louisiana water thrush making it a little bit up there, but most of their breeding grounds for all of these species is farther south from us. 
um, worm eating warbler, Louisiana wild thrush. Yeah. And so you can see um, on the right here, I have these are the occurrence charts from um, eBird for Pennsylvania as a whole. And you can see these different uh, times when birds are being seen and recorded on eBird. You can see how noticeable they are, like prothonotary warbler. You notice them in Pennsylvania starting in April, but really the bulk of it is May and June, and by July they start migrating south. Same thing with the Louisiana water thrush. You see them in through July, but by August they've pretty much petered out. They're, they've gone south. Kentucky warbler, don't really see them much at all in August. Now some of these you can still see them late. You can see some, a couple occurrences in September, October. That does happen, but by and large, these birds are moving out by August. Worm eating warbler is usually one of the first ones that I really, that's when I kind of notice fall migration is happening. I'll see a worm eating warbler in a habitat that's not quite right. Um, so moving on to the second wave. These are the local breeders. They breed throughout Pennsylvania and a little farther north. You can see golden wing warbler. Now they're not as common as they used to be, not as common as they were before eBird. So you're seeing not a lot of occurrences, but the peak, as they're showing here, is late August. Once you get in through September, they really aren't as noticeable. Um, blue wing warbler is definitely more abundant, especially in September. Um, you can see yellow warbler. The, the bulk of them, kind of August, September, petering out by the, before you get to October. Chestnut sided is a good example. You see that, that big uh, bump there in early September, late August. Um, other birds, Canada, hooded, oven bird. Oven bird goes a little bit further. Um, they're definitely here into October. Same thing with black throated blue and black throated green. Black throated green, I, I see them. I, I'm sure there's sometimes I even see them into November, uh, but their, their migration really starts earlier in the year and the bulk of them are usually moving through in September and pine warbler as well. Pine warbler is a little tricky because they are gonna spend the winter very close to where we are, just a little bit south of us. So sometimes they're lingering throughout the year. You'll see them in through the winter. Same with common yellow throat. All right, shifting onto the third wave. This is when you see things really start to turn over. Uh, this is when you'll, you start to really know that fall is here. It's like in the, in the spring when you start to get, um, you don't notice the, the white-throated sparrows as much. You know that they've moved on. In the fall, it's when you start to notice the white-throated sparrows again. That's, that's one of the signals. And one of the birds that I really notice in the warbler group are the yellow-rumped warblers. That's the sign of like, all right, migration is definitely on its like second half or this like third wave has really made it. Um, so magnolia warbler morning, um, northern water thrush, these are all birds that breed farther north for the most part. A lot of them do still breed in Pennsylvania. Um, Wilson's is farther north, Bay Breasted, Cape May, Nashville, um, Nashville just in like northern Pennsylvania. And you can see there really the bulk of their occurrences are in September into October. And as you get along further, you get to like Palm Warbler and Yellow Rump Warbler, the bulk of, of the occurrences for them are in October. And there you see Connecticut starting out in mid-September, Orange Crown mostly in October. Um, so focusing in on those waves, you can kind of get a better idea of what you're looking at. Um, you know, if it's August, it's probably not a Connecticut warbler, but there is always a chance. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about some different groups that I kind of work with when I'm when I see something that I'm a little confused by in the fall. So the dull and streaky uh, birds with wing bars. I don't have a better name for that at the moment. I'm sure there somebody has a good one. Um, water thrushes, the winged warblers, um, yellow warblers. And then I'll have a little quiz uh, kind of going over some of them and some other ones that are a little more obvious. That'll be an easier quiz. It'll get harder at the, the second one. Um, then the morning and Connecticut warblers, bay poles or difference between uh, bay breasted and black pole warblers. And then the Oreos that I mentioned earlier. So Oreo flippus, um, three species in that group. And then we'll have a final quiz. Um, all right, let's see. Any other questions here? Um, we've got Brent is asking, why do oven birds go quiet around mid-July? Uh, so a lot of times the reason that birds are singing is to defend their territories. And it's also to bring in mates as well, but a lot of it is just kind of staking their claim to a space. And once they've had young and they've fledged, there's really not a much reason to expend the energy to keep singing because they don't really have a territory that they need to defend. They start to move around a little bit more. Um, you can see this with birds that are tagged. They, they shift um, not just the, 
that primary location that they're hanging out in, but it's also the habitat will change as well. Um, I've seen this with golden wing warblers that'll hang out in those like power line cuts in the goldenrod fields, and then they'll shift into the woods, um, into the more forested areas before they migrate south. And you'll still hear the, some of these birds singing in the fall. I notice oven birds singing, hooded warblers singing, black and white warblers singing in the fall um, into September. Early mornings is really the only time they do it. I don't notice it later in the, in the day, but you'll still hear them a bit. All right, so we'll get into this. Um, the dull and streaky birds with wing bars. All right, so these are four birds that I really notice. You have cerulean warbler and blackburnian. They look remarkably similar. You have cerulean down here on the left, blackburnian up here on the right. Now the big difference between these, um, I guess I'll start with the similarities. So dark legs, um, dark bill, um, they have a, a bit of a broken eye ring. They have a, a pretty noticeable supercilium line. They're streaky on the underside with some kind of faint yellow or orange coloration, two wing bars. You can see that on both of them. That is pretty much the same with, with each species. The things that you notice is different are cerulean warbler, first of all, not really a component of a lot of the fall migration. They're usually out of here before September. Blackburnians really pick up in September and they're abundant then. But where you really see a difference is the, the body shape. So you can see cerulean warbler, really a stout warbler, really short. Um, the tail doesn't go very long at all. It's a very compact bird. Blackburnian warbler definitely has some length to it. You can see the tail extends out quite a, quite a bit. The beak is a little bit longer. The head, I guess, in general is longer. That's the key difference. Of course, male blackburnian warblers can be orange. Um, you'll really notice them. And the male ceruleans will be blue. Um, you notice that, but these are kind of some female immature type birds that can be really confusing. But that's the, the big difference that I notice is just the shape overall is, is very different on these birds. Um, another one to throw in here is Cape May. Now they tend to have kind of a, a lumped wing bar. You see like one big white patch is kind of hidden right here on this really younger bird. Um, they're streaky underneath. They've got this, um, a little bit of yellow margination on the wings. But the two things that I really notice, or I guess three things that I really notice on Cape Mays, the streaking on the underside is pretty fine and it can get a little blurry, but there's a lot of streaking and it goes throughout the breast. It's not just on the flanks. Um, the other thing is if you look at the beak, if you ever get a chance to look at a Cape May warbler beak, the top, the top mandible there is actually, um, has a bit of a, a curve to it. And so it looks like it has a little bit of a hooked beak. And that's a really um, easy thing to see when you get a good look at them. Go, oh, okay, that's, I can tell that's a Cape May. It's got that kind of curve to it. And then the other thing is, if you ever get to see them fly, you'll see they have um, yellow upper tail coverts. That's really obvious for them. Um, once they start to fly around, you see those yellow upper tail coverts. Um, the other one in with this group, you could also put it in with the bay poles, is pine warbler. So pine warbler has the wing bars. It'll have some streaking underneath. It doesn't have any streaking up on top, though. On the mantle, it's not streaked. They're pretty dull overall. Um, one thing to really notice, um, usually fairly fairly um, uniform, darker legs. They can get a little pale if they're a little aged, but kind of a thicker bill is really noticeable. They're usually a little more lethargic. They're hanging out in pines primarily. They like to stick with the pine trees. Um, those are the ways that I really identify pine warblers in the fall. Not a big component of migration. I usually start to notice them later in the year. Otherwise, they're kind of hanging out near breeding grounds. All right. Um, water thrushes. These can be um, very confusing if you don't get a good look at them. Uh, but like I showed earlier in those occurrence maps, Louisiana water thrush has moved out of the area by August. Um, that's they're they're out of here pretty quickly. Um, Northern water thrush is actually a, has a fairly significant fall migration through Pennsylvania. You really notice them in September. Obviously, the big differences, if you can see it, are the throats. There's streaking on the throat for northern water thrush. No streaking for Louisiana. Um, another difference, um, northern water thrush has two different plumage types, so they'll have a more yellow color underneath, or they'll be very pale. This one's more of a paler one. Um, the Louisiana water thrush does not show that yellow underneath. They'll just have a little bit of yellow on the flanks and on the vent, and that's about it. Um, streaking is much uh, finer on northern water thrush, um, not as fine on Louisiana. You also have a color, uh, uh, color of the legs are different. Um, darker on northern and kind of pinkish on Louisiana. Um, but really, Louisiana isn't much of an issue. You don't have, I don't find them that much in fall migration. And again, you have the habitat difference. Uh, Louisiana water thrush likes running water. Northern water thrush likes 
puddles, still water. I even find them in puddles in farm fields on the edge of like a, a um, kind of a tree liner and shrub thicket. I can see them hanging out there mixed in with other warblers. Um, all right, so the winged warblers. So we've got golden wing warbler, blue wing warbler, pretty clear cut. You can see golden wing warblers on the left, blue wing warblers on the right. That's the obvious part. Where it gets confusing are the hybrids. So you have the other winged warblers. So these are, we have names for Lawrence's and Brewster's, which generally fall into these categories of, um, I guess this one's probably like classic Brewster's and here's uh, the Lawrence's warbler. Really distinctly different, but then you start to get these things in between. You have this Brewster's that has a yellow throat and maybe a yellow breast, um, same down here. And then here's one that kind of looks like a golden wing warbler, but it's got yellow on the breast. So you start to see these differences. I've even seen um, blue wing warblers uh, that have different colored wing bars. One of them's gold, one of them's white. Um, so you start to notice those different changes and you're like, all right, where does this fall in that spectrum? And it can be really fun to see um, the differences that come up, especially as this hybridization has happened more and more. All right. Um, Moving on to the yellow warblers. All right, so we have hooded, Wilson's, yellow, and common yellow throat. These will all look yellow in the fall, especially the younger birds and the females. So this comes down a lot to the shape of the bird. That's the biggest factor here. So if you look, we have on the top right, you have yellow warbler. Um, they're pretty uniform yellow all over. There's not much difference in the adult males. You'll see more green on the back. This one's probably an adult female. They have an eye ring. Um, they have a little bit of a, a longer beak, just a, a little bit of a longer profile overall, um, kind of flatter head, really stands out. Sometimes you'll notice them um, being pretty extended, almost having like a, I wanna say it's like a dolphin-like look to them. They're, they're really kind of long. Um, other, let's see, and then hooded, also a larger, longer bird, but the head is so much larger on hooded warblers. And they have this green over their back and they still have a green hood that hangs over top of their head. Very large beak, um, pretty chunky warbler overall. And they like to hang out low on the ground. The yellow warblers, um, I don't notice them too much later in fall migration, but I do, when I do notice them, they are in um, wetland areas. All right, whoops. Um, so then moving on. Um, Wilson's warbler. This is that Cardellina genus that we were talking about earlier. So they have this really round shape to their head. Um, they have a, a little bit of longer tail, rounder head, kind of a plump bird. Uh, really noticeable when you're seeing Wilson's without that black cap. So the males are really obvious with a black cap. The females are the immature birds. Round head. You can see this difference. Their eye looks like it's a little bit farther back on their face than other birds, especially like common yellowthroat. It looks like it's a lot um, shorter distance between the eye and the bill. And then common yellowthroat can be very variable here um, from the immature females to the adult males um, showing that full face mask. So I notice there's a lot of olive on the sides of these birds. They'll have the yellow throat, but otherwise very olive overall. Um, small, usually um, hanging out in shrubs, close to wetlands, um, low to the ground. Let's see. Um, and we got a couple questions here. So with the hooded, um, uh, Rob Mulvihill, who has a lot of experience seeing uh, um, seeing hooded warblers up close. Um, yes, the big eye, big beak. Um, those are the two big things for hooded warblers here. And then another question, um, identifying oven bird versus wood thrush. Um, size, completely different. Um, behavior, completely different. Oven birds walk around almost like a chicken. So they have this kind of like plucky look to them where, and they'll like bob their head as they're walking and bouncing around. Very distinctive chip note as well, once you notice the difference. And wood thrushes are, are very red. Like they have this red um, brown color to them. Lots of really bold spots underneath. And, um, and yeah, size is a big difference though. Victoria has a question in the Q and A. Uh, she asks, where are places slash habitats to find golden winged warblers in the fall? Gotcha. Good question. Um, golden winged warblers, I really notice um, 
pretty similar to their breeding grounds. I mean, the, the scrubby areas, power line cuts are fantastic for them, uh, but you got to look early, early in the year. Uh, the ones that I've seen, game lands are really fantastic. Any state game lands that you have around you that maintains openings, um, they like to, to mix up habitats with uh, fields next to, um, you have windbreaks like these different tree lines and shrub thickets. Right on the edges of those is a really fantastic place to look for golden wing warblers, especially if there's goldenrod around. It can be tough, but um, they're still around. I've seen some in my area in the Harrisburg, Carlisle area. Um, in game lands near me. That's that's where I recommend looking for them. And if you hear one singing, which you can hear them singing in the fall, always take a look because if it's singing a blue wing warbler song, it might not be a blue wing warbler. Same with golden wing. It could be a hybrid. It could be the other species entirely. Um, doing work in Honduras, we were. Um, I was I was helping uh, a, a PhD student um, catch golden wing warblers and we'd have to lure them in with audio calls and to a to a mist net that we had set up and so we would try golden wing songs and then you would play like a mobbing song of like different birds being agitated in central america um, with ferruginous pygmy owls being the main agitator and you'd get all the different birds would come in and we were getting a lot more blue wing warblers coming into the golden wing song so we mixed it up and we played the blue wing song and we ended up getting more golden wing warblers you know, small sample size, just anecdotal, but I thought that was really interesting. They're definitely cued into each other's songs. So always take a look, uh, a closer look if you hear the song. But yeah, early successional habitat, especially with goldenrod is a key for, for the winged warblers. All right. Okay, let's, um, let's have a little quiz here. So um, throw, in your, throw in your answers in the chat and let's see what people think about this one. I didn't go over this, but this is a really fun one in the fall, um, the, the bright green head, and this will be a good lesson for people seeing this. Yeah, so people are chiming in. Overwhelmingly for chestnut-sided warbler, I call them chestnuts in the fall. Uh, big, big thing is that bright green on the top. It's all you need to see. They got an eye ring, nothing going on underneath. Sometimes they'll have those chestnut flanks, um, the yellowish wing bars, but bright green, always gonna be chestnut-sided warbler. So really fun. All right, how about this one? We covered this a little bit. We're starting out easy. It's already creeping along a branch. All right, everybody's chiming in here. Yeah, black and white. So it's pretty obvious it's already black and white, but the big thing with this bird, look at the undertail. So look in, So I showed you the, the warbler guide uh, screenshot earlier showing the undertails, the warbler butts, really key for, for knowing this species that streaking on the undertail coverts, really obvious. If you only see that, you know it's a black and white warbler. All right. Okay, now we've got one of the yellows. One of these yellowish warblers. What are people thinking for this one? Orange crown. Hooded. Hooded. Yellow. This one's interesting. You got the, the yellow showing overall. Um, <laughs> Rob Mulville already chimed in. So yeah, I think this is Rob Mulville's photo from, from Powder Mill. Um, so this is showing a yellow warbler. Now, I it's a little tricky. I, I tried to throw you off a little bit. It looks like it has a big eye and a big beak, but if you notice the back, it's just this kind of grayish, olive, yellowish color. There's no real contrast here between um, like you're not seeing a hood, you're not seeing that big headed look of the, the hooded warbler, but you see this kind of long extended look. I almost say it's like dolphin-y looking of, of a yellow warbler. Kind of some yellow throughout, but not anything very distinctive. So this is uh, either a young or a female bird. And um, <laughs> Rob Mulvihill, as Bob Mulvihill has pointed out, that it's an Alaskan race that actually made it through Pennsylvania. That's showing again, these birds coming all the way up from Alaska and then moving down through Pennsylvania. Pretty remarkable journey. All right. How about this one? Don't look at its face too much. I think it has a couple ticks on it. But this one is really obvious just by the tail. And we didn't go over this one either, but this is all you need to see is the tail to know this bird. So if you got yellow underneath, you got some streaking, you got white wing bars, gray on top, it'll show some green on the mantle. But right here, people are getting it. It's a magnolia warbler. 
So this one has got this bi-colored tail, white and then black. Chad said Rod Stewart bird. I'll have to, yep, there you go. <laughs> so yeah, white and black. You'll know it every time, anytime you see that. You don't need to see any part from this forward. You know it's a magnolia or a Maggie. All right. How about this bird? This is the last one in this quiz. So it's another one of those yellow warblers. We've got the wing bars, or sorry, not yellow. Do they have it in? Sorry, this is one of the um, gray streaky with the wing bars. So you got wing bars, you got gray and streaky. I've got Cape May, Cerulean Pine, Cape May, Hooded, all over the place now with the, with the guesses. All right, this one, here we go. Somebody got it. This is a pine warbler. Good job, Sean. All right, so big thing to look for, look at the beak, really chunky beak. That's a really easy way to tell that this is a pine warbler. Um, if you zoomed out, I'm sure it's hanging out in a pine grove, but that beak really gives it away. It's a chunky bird. Um, they're larger, they've got some um, robustness to them and the behavior will also give this away when you actually see it in sight. But you can see no streaking on the back. Um, Kate Mays will show streaking. If you could see the upper tail coverts, it would be just this olive color going through. It's yellow on Kate Mays. Um, broken eye ring, you can see no supercilium. Um, yeah, so that's pine warbler. All right. So the next group, this one can really cause people fits. Um, Connecticut and morning warblers. Um, so the adults are pretty obvious. Morning warblers, uh, the adult males, I should say, morning warblers, the gray head, um, they'll have that dark black patch right there on the, the top of the breast. Um, and then they're green on top, yellow underneath. Um, Connecticut warbler, the dull gray hood, green on the back, yellow underneath. And in the fall, I've noticed this a lot. Um, maybe Bob Mulvihill can, can explain this, but I've noticed Connecticut warbler, actually my first Connecticut warbler I ever saw in the fall, had a dark gray spot on the upper part of the breast where you see it on morning warblers. And, I, and I've seen the photos of them several places showing that. It's very distinctive, but with a full eye ring, that's the big difference between them. The uh, morning warblers have a broken eye ring. Connecticut warbler is a full eye ring. As a full eye ring, dark, pat, dark gray patch on the top of the breast there. Um, it's the picture that I showed earlier for Connecticut warbler um, with the, the same look in the back. Really fun look at a Connecticut in the fall that you only see. But otherwise, the really big difference that you notice with these birds, you can see them in hand. This is at Penn State from, you see the same fence in the background here. Morning warbler on the right, Connecticut warbler on the left. Now, the shape of the birds, very different. So you can see morning warblers, long tail, long under tail coverts that extend over halfway back the tail. Morning or uh, Connecticut warbler, short tail. Um, the under tail coverts do also extend pretty far back as well, but the tail overall is very short. Morning warblers have a much longer tail, slimmer profile. Um, Connecticut warbler, very chunky, shorter tail. Um, the other thing to notice, chip notes really stand out between these two birds, um, but behaviors are pretty similar. They're both skulking. You see them close to the ground here in these pictures. But if you can't get a look at the eye ring, which in morning warbler is going to be broken, and Connecticut warbler is going to be um, full, um, the just looking at the, the overall size and the the tail is really distinctive. All right, the bay poles. I think this one gives people more fits than anything else. So bay-breasted black pole warbler. Those are the two different warblers we're talking about here. So you've got. Um, uh, bay-breasted warbler on the left, black pole warbler on the right. So differences between them, there's many. Um, you notice on the bay-breasted warbler, it has green on the sides of its neck. It has dark feet. It's got buffy undertail coverts. They're not going to be white. And it has really no streaking on the sides. You can see a little bit of that bay color kind of shining through on this one. Those aren't streaks, that's that actual bay-breasted, bay the bay um, patches. Now, if you go over here to black pole warbler, you can see gray on the side of the head, not that green color. You've got streaking. You've also got yellow feet, if you can get a good look at them. You can't see it too well on this one. And then white undertail coverts. 
So that's the difference between them primarily. And there's some variation. You can get birds that are very yellow overall, and those are the females or immature females. And here's a picture of them um, next to each other. So you can see right away on the left, no streaking on the underside. None at all. It's got a greenish patch here. It's got these really nice warm colors to it. You can see this kind of um, fun buffy color kind of going through on the breast and that'll go to the undertail coverts. This is a, a bay breasted warbler. Here's a black pole warbler on the right. You can see a little bit of the yellow feet, darker feet on the, on the bay breasted. And you can see some of the gray on the side of the head there. All right, and this is the last group that I'm gonna be talking about. So these are the Oreos. These are what I call the Oreos. They're not in, this, in the genus Oreophilippus anymore, but I still like to call them that because it's catchy. So we've got Nashville, Tennessee, and orange crowned warblers. And here's some pictures showing them in different plumages. You've got Nashville on the right. They're usually pretty similar. The males, the adult males will have a red top, um, a, a, a red spot on their cap, and more in bolder colors as usual. Um, the females won't have the red and they'll be duller overall. But you see a gray head, green back, yellow body. Um, and shifting over to orange crown warbler, you have um, two different variations. One's a little bit more yellow, one's a bit more gray, but generally a gray head, green back. Um, and then the underside is yellow, but really most of the yellow on these birds is on the undertail coverts. It's bright yellow underneath here. And they're pretty um, kind of, Stout birds overall, round head, broken eye ring. You got a full eye ring on Nashville, broken eye ring on Orange Crown Warbler, and a broken eye ring on Tennessee. And moving over to Tennessee, you have three different looks to them. You've got this like immature female, which is yellow overall, except for white undertail coverts. So Tennessee is white undertail coverts. Um, Orange Crown has yellow undertail coverts. Big way to tell them apart. You can see how thin their bill is as well, really noticeable. Here's an adult male. It looks, I think they look like mini red Iberias. So they've got that gray head, they got the, the eye line going through there, they got a green back and a white underneath. Um, and here's probably an adult female. It's got more green and yellows showing through, but still white undertail coverts. It's got the eye line, broken eye ring, um, little supercilium line, pretty thin bill. Um, so that's the, the big difference between these three. Um, you're lucky if you find an orange crown in the fall, that's always a treat. Goldenrod fields are really the best place to find them, usually in October. All right. So here's our last quiz for the night. Um, this is a good one to start out with. If you're birding in September, October, this is the, the one you're gonna see the most. It's in a birch tree. Um, I love seeing them in birches, usually on ridge tops moving through Pennsylvania. Let's see what people think for this one. We got one guest so far. Anybody else chiming in? Black pole, palm, yellow. So wing bars, streaking. It's got a broken eye ring. It's got pretty bold white undertail coverts. And then a couple guesses here. This is a black pole. So that white undertail coverts, the streaking on the sides, the gray side of the neck, broken eye ring, wing bars, streaking. This is what makes up a lot, a bulk of the migration in like late September and early October, I notice. The, the bulk of the migrants are black pole warblers. All right, how about this one? Looks pretty similar to the first one. I'll give you that. All right, a bunch of guesses in here. Everybody pretty unanimous so far. All right, bay-breasted warbler, yeah. A lot of people are already guessing that. So green side of the neck, really obvious there, no streaking underneath. Um, uh, you can really see the difference between this one and the last one. So, and off-white undertail coverts getting towards Buffy, but off-white, uh, but just a really clean look overall. And they have a distinctly different peak for their migration. So bay-breasted warblers are really peaking in like the middle of September. Early middle September, like the 10th through the 20th is usually when I really notice bay-breasted warblers picking up. After that, it's it's just all black pole till, till you get through mid-October. All right, how about this one? So no wing bars. We got three colors going on here. We got um, gray, green, and yellow. A little bit of white, but mostly those three colors. 
So we're already moving into the Oreos. We got the three colors, no wing bars, no real defining characteristics, but those um, gray, green, and yellow. One big way to tell us apart from the others, yellow undertail coverts. So this one's an orange crown warbler. Got a bunch of people already got that one right. Um, can be really tricky, but if you look at how um, kind of circular the head is, it's really round head, small beak, nice and pointy. Uh, but the yellow underneath, particularly yellow undertail coverts, gray head, green back, really fun. All right, next one. Similar color scheme here, a little different look. So you can't see the underside of it too well. You see a little bit of white, a little bit of yellow up here. Green back, gray head, but really thin beak, eye line shining through. The face pattern is pretty bold, kind of shorter tail. Yeah, this one's a Tennessee. Nice thin profile, looks like a mini red eyed vireo without the red eye. Yeah, it's a Tennessee warbler. All right, last one. Last quiz bird here. This is a tough one. No guesses yet. Oh, a lot of different things popping up. We got Morning Warbler, Nashville Warbler, got Philadelphia Vireo, Nashville, Common Yellowthroat. Cape May. So this was a trick. This one's actually Philadelphia Viria, one of my favorite fall migrants to see alongside the warblers. But if you look at the head and the overall size, which is tough to see, it's a lot larger and it has that nice hooked beak, which gives it away as a Viria. Um, really cute face to it. Um, really cute uh, Viria, yellow underneath. Um, another one of those birds that makes a, a much further east migration in the fall than in the spring. Um, awesome bird to find. Curveball. <laughs> um, and some, I'd like to thank people contributed photos. I'll throw Bob Mulva Hill in there as well from Powder Mill. Um, uh, different people that I've had the pleasure of interacting with and helping out on some of their banding stations. Um, all right, any other questions that we have at the end there? Give people a chance. Looks like Jason has a question about which warbler also had the curved upper mandible. Ah, uh, that one is Cape May warbler. It won't show a hook, but it'll be, you'll notice a curve to it, which is, it's really fun, especially when you get to see them in hand. We have a question uh, in the Q&A. What is skulking? Skulking. All right. Um, skulking is basically when birds are hanging out really low to the ground and they're not moving very much and they're staying in the shadows, kind of like um, just walking along the ground very slowly. And they can move, you know, 10 feet at a time and you don't notice them. It's that really kind of secretive uh, movement. That's the best way to explain skulking. It's kind of the movement that you don't see. All right. Any other questions? I've commented uh, no means of Perula. Do you have any interesting insights into Perula you want to share? Perulas, um, let's see. Um, really fun birds. I mean, they have a lot of really cool coloration. Um, seeing the, the broken yellow on the throat, um, green on their back, um, just really pretty distinctive bird. Um, trying to think if there's any real big key characteristics that I noticed with them. I don't think so. I don't notice them singing too much. I honestly don't run into them that often in the fall. Um, but when I do, it's usually kind of closer to riparian areas. Um, like Bob Marble Hill says, bicolored bill. That's a good, um, good characteristic. Um, usually higher up in trees. Them and Nashville warblers, I notice higher in trees. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, last chance. Any other burning questions about warblers? Yeah, I, I guess <laughs> a couple of people saying, how can I remember? Um, this one's great for the confusing birds. Um, the warbler guide is fantastic. I don't have a copy of it. Um, the recording, of course. Uh, this is what I started out with. Um, the shapes aren't all that great, but you start to get the patterns down. And then my go-to is, is Sibley. That's my preferred field guide. If you're going to go to paper, um, he does a really good job. A uh, couple other things. Uh, yes, I will send the recording out to everyone. Julie asks, Ian, do you lead walks? And if so, what area? Um, I haven't led too many walks, but when I do, it's somewhat more plant-based, but I always point out the birds. Uh, Manita Conservancy, I, I, I'm trying to plan out some walks with them. Um, yeah, hopefully joining up with PSO at some point would be fantastic. I know the uh, the county spotlights are fantastic. I really, really think that's a great idea. I'd love to help out with that at some point. And maybe, who knows, I might be back the biggest week someday. That would be really fun. That's always a blast. Uh, okay, we have a couple of, of things that have come up in the Q&A. Um, which warbler is your favorite during fall migration? Ooh, favorite warbler, um, orange crown. Absolutely. It's a, it's a rare treat when I get to see them, but I, I always love it. They're not the showiest. They're kind of the epitome of confusing fall warbler, just kind of drab, but just such subtle color differences and, and really just beautiful bird in my opinion. Um, and I always feel very fortunate to find one. And then we also have a question. Do you have those references written down somewhere for the books? Um, I, I do not, but, um, I think we also had Bob Mulvihill said, uh, the Peterson Warbler Guide is also good. So look for the Warbler Guide. That's probably the go-to. Um, so that's uh, that's what I would look up, the Warbler Guide. It also has a, an app version. Like you there get you the big chunky book, but you can also buy it as an app. And it has what I think is just the coolest feature on any app that I've ever had. Let me see. Okay, I'm going to see if I can show it. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I've got the app up. I brought up um, the American Red Start and you can move it around to see the bird from different angles on your oh, phone. Yeah. You see it from below, from that angle, you can see what the, the Red Start looks like from that angle. And you can do that for like all the warbler species and it has them in the guide. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's really helpful. Absolutely. Um, yeah. looks like another question. This one's actually pretty important. Um, you mentioned birding in game lands, but I'm hesitant to bird there because of hunters. How can I keep safe other than wearing orange? The big thing with going out birding in the fall, um, besides wearing orange is to know what season you're in. So I avoid going out during a deer rifle season. It is very dangerous. I don't like to be out there on the game lands. There's a lot of people out there but that's also in November and December. So you don't have to worry about that for, for looking for warblers. That's the migration is ended by that point. So not as big a concern. The things you have to watch out for, um, people going out for squirrel. I see people going out for squirrel a lot and it's usually just a pleasant conversation with them. I don't notice any, any real problems. Um, just be obvious, don't, don't, uh, don't hide or act like a squirrel, I guess. I don't know. Um, I, ha I honestly haven't had any problems in game lands. Um, I always wear orange um, and stay in, usually stay near the trails. Things to watch out for, people going out for um, turkey, for small game, and for uh, deer. <laughs> Wait, someone's <laughs> joining me for a little bit. This is Everett. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so what's a don't skull? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've always found that when I am out in game lands looking for warblers, it you know I just stay on the the road with there you know usually there's like a road going through, and then you don't have that problem of like having them the warblers kind of like over you 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 know if the if the trees are kind of a little off to the side from the road, then yeah. it's usually one of the best places to find birds is just from the road and not trying to go off on any trails or anything. Yeah. Um, another thing, uh, bring a buddy. <laughs> yeah. You're a lot more obvious when there's more than one of you. Um, and it's also more enjoyable. 
Uh, it's just always a great idea to bring some friends with you. Some of the best birding I've had is when there's like five to 10 people and we're all along a really nice tree cut and you're like, oh, okay, we're all like picking out parts of this like um, section of forest. And you're like, all right, the, the sky, you know, the, the sun's coming in, lighting up that tree line. Let's pick out what's moving through. And you can see them all kind of moving through the trees together and you can go, oh, okay, there's a big cluster of Maggie's going through over here, black turtle green, black turtle blue, whatever. It's really fun. And then someone finds the cool one and you're like, oh, get me on that one. Where's that? So it's it's really enjoyable. Um, dove season, Mike Schultz pointing out. Yeah, that's something to keep an eye out for. Um, usually open fields, you're finding people hunting doves. So um, I don't run into too many issues. But if guys are out there and, and you know, they're out hunting, just give them a wide berth. You know, they're, they're looking for, for game. So, um, you know, everybody's out there for a reason, give them their space. Same thing with people on horses. Um, but yeah, um, I would say, uh, pretty much every interaction I've ever had with hunters in game lands has been pleasant. I mean, you can have a conversation with them, ask them what they're seeing. They're going to ask you what you're seeing. It's usually pretty enjoyable. Everybody's out there to enjoy the day, even if you're not getting anything. <laughs> I agree. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, thank you very much. It was wonderful. This is great. Yeah. Thanks for so much for joining us, Ian. Yeah, the, I, everyone seemed very excited. You know, this is just getting all, all so excited for what's now starting to come through. Yeah. So enjoy the fall. Definitely appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. We're sure to have some more of these in the future, uh, these webinars. And there's the uh, Union County Spotlight coming up in October. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. Happy birding, everyone. <laughs> All right. Well, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>